So tonight, I want to discuss something that's really important. I want to continue with the fruit of the Spirit, but I want to talk about self-control. <clears throat> As I was working on this, I think the Holy Spirit really worked through me to try to write everything that was going to have purpose. And what I feel is that this teaching is going to be extremely important to anybody seeking a new life. But more than that, I think it's imperative that any new Christian understands what I'm going to teach tonight. Understands that <clears throat> this is one of the things that we gain when we gain salvation in Jesus. So let's start in prayer. Heavenly Father, I pray that you guide me and direct me as I do this teaching, Lord. Help me to give this message to whoever is out there who needs to hear it, Lord. That you draw them to you. That you allow them to, to gain whatever knowledge you wish them to gain, Lord. And that they that their ears open and their their hearts are, are softened. And that they're, they accept the information coming from you, Father. In your name, Jesus, I pray. Amen. <clears throat> I want to start tonight with reading Galatians 5, 13 through 21. This is the passage that I usually go through when I'm talking about the spirits, but I want to read the whole passage tonight. It says, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. But as you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. But I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are under the law. Now, the works of the flesh are evident. Sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, amity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, revelry, dissension, division, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you, as I warned you before, that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. And then it talks about the fruit of the spirits. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. Ultimately, the point <clears throat> of our entire existence is a test in self-control. All addictions, sins, afflictions, pains, suffering are rooted in man's lack of self-control. The fruit of the spirit it's mentioned, talks about what we gain when we gain salvation. And the very last one it mentions is self-control. It's very unlikely that this is placed in this position for no reason. See, self-control is the hardest fruit to gain, but it's the fruit that the most hinges on. It's the one that you have to have in order to grow as a Christian. See, self-control, when truly considered, is, is, very, is the very reason that all things have been in motion since God created humanity. It's even possible that God's acknowledgement of our lack of self-control is, is why he put the plan in motion that he did before creation even started. See, God is omnipresent. He knows everything before it happens. He knew, he knew everything about us before he ever created us. So we can assume that God knew we would eat the fruit of knowledge and thereby fall from grace in the garden. God would have to change everything so that mankind could be saved from the destruction of their own making. He made a plan specifically for sinners. And since we are all sinners, it was a plan that encapsulated all mankind. 
In Isaiah 46, 8 through 10, it says, Remember this and stand firm. Recall to mind your transgressions. Remember the former things of old, for I am God and there is no other. I am God and there is none like me, declaring the end from the beginning and from the ancient times things not yet done, saying my counsel shall stand and I will accomplish all my purposes. Every individual who calls themselves Christian starts their walk outside the grace of God. <clears throat> this is not because God hasn't offered us salvation. It's not because God hasn't given us a gift that we can choose or not choose. It's because we are living in a state of sin. The fact is that sin, no matter how we label it, is the absence of self-control. We have partaken in some activity, some thought or action that separates us from the presence of God. We are separated because the Father cannot stand the presence of sin. He, being pure and perfect in every way, is offended by the mere presence of sin. Jesus, our Lord, had to step in, take our sins upon himself, die on the cross, so that we'd be washed of our taint. All this, the plan of God the Father, the act of surrender by Jesus the Son, and the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, were all a resolution to the problem of man's lack of self-control. Romans 8, 1 through 4 says, there is, therefore no, there is therefore now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ, for the law of sin and death. For God has done what the law, weakened by the flesh, could not do. By sending his own Son in the likeness of sinful flesh, and for sin he condemned sin, in the flesh, in order that the righteous requirement of the law might be fulfilled in us, who walk not according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. See, sin is not a sin unless you acknowledge the sin. Sin can only be missing the mark if we know what the target is. Now, that's the very definition of sin, is to miss the mark. Sin is only a sin when we as humans acknowledge that we are doing wrong and that we have a standard of morality that spells out that act as unrighteous. As we have already discussed, morality is rooted in God. All morality is founded in God the Father. So our sin is not dictated by our opinions, feelings, or emotions. It is a concrete concept. It's a concept based on God and the Bible. However, it also depends on knowledge, understanding, and rationalization of each individual person. And this is exactly why it's so important that we understand free will of each individual. The free will of each individual is so very fundamentally important to salvation in Christianity. It's a choice. In Romans 10, <clears throat> 9 through 11 says, that if you confess with your mouth that Lord, the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. For with the heart one believes into righteousness, and with the mouth confesses is made into salvation. For the scripture says, whoever believes on him will not be put to shame. You see, the reason that Adam and Eve had not sinned prior to eating the apple is because there was no knowledge of a moral duty or action. Please grasp this. This is, this is extremely important. It's because every act that Adam and Eve performed, regardless of, their, of our current moral stance, was without sin when they were in the garden before they ate the apple. You understand? The, <laughs> There was no knowledge that their actions, activities, statements, anything that they did was good or bad. Their lack of knowledge of good and evil freed them from the sin and the taint of that sin. See, God the Father, who could not be in the presence of sin because it's abhorrent to him, did not see anything that they did as sinful. Now, this is because there was no personal acknowledgement that they were breaking any moral law. That does not imply in any way that there was no morality that existed. It existed even in the garden, but, but what it does show is that morality and our knowledge of good and evil are forever linked 
and how God sees us and perceives us. Adam and Eve's actions prior to the apple were not considered sin. Now, some would say <clears throat> that that's not true. However, all we have to do to show that this is true is read. In the garden, Adam and Eve walked naked, even procreated in the garden. They showed themselves to animals, gods, and angels alike. And at no time did they cover themselves until they gained knowledge that their nakedness was a sin. Just a short few chapters later, we see that there's a moral code that states that nakedness in front of others is a sin. Well, if this is a fact, and we know it is, then we can only surmise that it was not a sin for Adam and Eve until, until they gained the knowledge of good and evil. Now, this should help you to see how very important our knowledge of truth is and how very important God's morality is to your everyday life. That knowledge and obedience to God's moral law is what determines how the Father values and sees your life. With, without Jesus, we're held to a different standard. In Ezekiel 18, 32 says, Therefore I will judge you, O host Israel, everyone according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent and turn from all your transgressions so that iniquity will not be your ruin. Cast away from you all the transgressions which you have committed and get yourself a new heart and a new spirit. For why should you die, O house Israel? For I have no pleasure in the death of one who dies, says the Lord God. Therefore turn and live. Now this talks about the house of Israel. and We've been grafted into the house of Israel. And it talks about a new heart and a new spirit, which is what we gain when we gain salvation in Jesus. God had a plan to sacrifice his son before the foundations of the earth. <laughs> before they were ever even considered. It's scary to think that the word, also known as Jesus, who was with God in the beginning, already knew he would have to die for mankind. Jesus had to watch as Adam and Eve ate the fruit that sealed his need to be crucified. We as Christians are lucky because Jesus, our Lord, died so that we could be covered by his blood. This sacrifice allows us to be seen by the Father as righteous regardless of our sin, of our past sin. This is clearly spelled out in Romans 5 and 6, which I encourage you to read. If, if we read this and understand but it says our self-control takes on an entirely different aspect because Jesus is in the equation. It must, be, it must be explained that sin and morality are both based on self-control. Our, our knowledge and acceptance of moral law is what determines the level of sin in our lives. It needs to be clarified that you do not have to know the rules to be held to the standard of the rules. This is important. The Bible says that the law is written in our hearts, so not, that, so not knowing the rules is not a possibility. It's written on our heart. We, we know what we're supposed to do and what, we, what we're, we should and shouldn't do. We live in a time when Christ's forgiveness is available to all, and no one has any excuse for not knowing God's morality. They can choose to ignore it, but they cannot say they did not hear it or have the opportunity to accept the gift of it. In Jeremiah 31, 31 through 34, it says, Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the, their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand and brought them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though it was their husband Though I was their husband, declares the Lord, for this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my laws within them, and I will write it on their hearts, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbors and each his brother, saying, Now know the Lord, for they shall all know me, for the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord, for I will forever or forgive their iniquities. And I will remember their sins no more. This acknowledgement should allow you to grasp how very important self-control is to our stance with Jesus. 
Jesus gave us direction and teachings so that we would have concrete truths that spell out God's morality. These teachings are not flimsy thoughts or opinions that we should we just should just, just not consider. These are rules and dictates that Jesus expected us to obey. In order to gain salvation and eternal life, we have to acknowledge Jesus as our Lord and Savior. That's how we gain salvation. We believe in him, we acknowledge him, we announce him, and he becomes our Lord and Savior. The acceptance of the gift of salvation comes with an understanding that God will move you, direct you, and help you to grow in your faith and knowledge. This is the indwelling of the Holy Spirit. That's what it's about. In Deuteronomy 36, it says, And the Lord your God will circumcise your heart and the heart of your offspring, so that you will love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, that you may live. The deeper your education in biblical teachings and Jesus' instruction, the greater your knowledge of righteousness will grow. The presence of the Holy Spirit in you will provide conviction when you are not acting in the will of God. Your level of knowledge, in some ways, should dictate your actions. That being said, your self-control or lack of self-control based on your conviction provided by the Holy Spirit ultimately defines your level of commitment to Jesus. As a Christian, you're covered by the blood of Jesus. When the Father looks upon you, he only sees Jesus. This is extremely important for you to understand. Paul says that we have the ability to sin but shouldn't because we as followers of Jesus we are dead to sin. What does this mean? This means that when we are saved, we are covered by the blood of Jesus and we no longer have sin. It's gone. We're covered. When God sees us from that point on, no matter what happens from that point on, we're covered by the blood of Jesus. We are dead to sin, which means sin can't even see us. They can't find us. As far as sin in this world is considered, we're dead. It can't stick to us. Jesus holds you to a certain level. He expects you to abide in his teachings and to listen to the Holy Spirit. This is why all followers of Christ call themselves bondservants to Christ, because they're ultimately slaves to his teaching and the morality of God. In Romans 6, 1 through 5, it says, What shall we say then? Shall we continue to sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live longer in it? Or do you know, do you not know that as many of us as were baptized in Christ were baptized into his death? Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death. That just as Christ was raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in the newness of life. We should never act contrary to the convictions of the Holy Spirit. The fruit of the Spirit will manifest if we allow ourselves to obey the Word of God and walk in the will of God. It's not easy to be a Christian. Christianity is rewarding, it's joyful, and it's worth our time and commitment, but it's not easy. Self-control is a fruit because when we develop our knowledge, belief, and relationship with Christ, we find that we are able to minimize the presence of unrighteous activities in our life. That does not mean that all negative action just disappears or that, that it's, un, it's just completely unrealistic to believe that we're going to be perfect in every way. We can't be perfect in every way. That's why Jesus had to cover us with the blood. Because no matter how you look at things, you will sin again. You're not going to be perfect from the time you're saved on. But sin can't stick to you. Do you understand? You died to sin. Sin can no longer find you. I have people come to me all the time and ask me, am, am I going to be damned again? Am I going to lose my salvation? You cannot lose your salvation. You are saved once, always saved, because Jesus covered you with his blood, which means you are dead to sin. Sin can't stick to you. That means that you shouldn't be acting in a sinful way. But even if you do, sin can't stick to you. The only thing the Father sees when he looks at you is the blood of Jesus. He sees the blood of Jesus. He sees his son. Nothing has stuck to you since the day you said that he was your Lord. Nothing you've done, any of those bad things, if you repent, they're gone. They don't stick to you. What the Holy Spirit does is let you realize what is wrong. The Holy Spirit lets you see what is unrighteous and what will ultimately cause you harm. 
The conviction you feel is not condemnation. It is a redirection, not a damnation. You are saved. So damnation is no longer a concern. When we are saved, when we are dead to sin, we become much like Adam and Eve were before the fall, before the fruit. We are able to do as we like, and sin does not taint us. The blood of Jesus covers us completely. So in a very simple way, a very childlike way, sin simply cannot stick to you. It bounces right off. Because we are dead in sin, we are no longer a vessel for the taint of sin. This makes us pure and perfect in the eyes of the Father. It is the blood of Jesus that cleaned us, and that is forever cleaning us in his eyes. This is why Romans says we can sin, but by no means should we sin. We are no longer held to the standard of the law. However, the law never disappeared. If anything, the new covenant with Christ supersedes the law. <clears throat> Because our Lord Jesus died for us and saved us from damnation, we should have a heartfelt desire to live as pure and righteous a life as possible. This is why the Holy Spirit is within you, to help you live as you were intended and not as the flesh dictates. This is why the fruit of the Spirit of self-control is almost always the last to manifest and the most important to your growth in Christ. You have to have self control. Does that mean that you're going to be perfect? No. It means that you're always striving to be like your Lord Jesus. Matthew 5, 17 through 20 says, Do not think that I have come to abolish the law or the, or the prophets. I have come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. I have not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. For truly I say to you, until heaven and earth pass away, not an iota, not a dot will pass from the law until all was accomplished. Therefore, whoever relaxes one of these, the least of these commandments, and teaches others to do the same, will be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whoever does them and teaches them will be great, called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I tell you, unless your righteousness exceeds that of the scribes and Pharisees, you'll never enter the kingdom of heaven. But our righteousness does exceed them. Because we're covered by the blood of Jesus and the Father sees only his Son. And the Son exceeds in righteousness. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbors as yourself. Galatians 5, 14. Thank you. And I hope you understand now that we're not no longer held to the standard. We're no longer held to those things. When somebody is saved, they break the chains. Jesus breaks the chains and throws them down. They're no longer there. They're gone. You have died to sin. Why? Why would you want to pick the chains back up and put them on? To be afraid that something that you're going to do or some action you're going to perform is going to damn you to hell. Why would you pick them chains back up? Do you not understand? When you are saved, you are forever saved. Any sin that attacks you, any mistakes you made, you can repent and go back. You are always saved. You are always covered by the blood of Jesus. It doesn't wash off. It doesn't disappear. The Father is omnipresent. He knew what you were going to do before you were saved, after you were saved, and for all eternity. He knew what you were going to do. He knew what you could possibly do. And he saved you anyway. That's why you're dead to sin. Stop worrying about things. Stop putting on chains that don't belong to you. They're gone. Let them go. Live for Christ. Be his bondservant. Listen to the Holy Spirit and follow it. And you'll produce fruit. Thank you. Heavenly Father, thank you for allowing me to teach this. Thank you, Lord, for giving it to me through the Holy Spirit. And Lord, I, I pray that something that I said touches somebody who's listening, somebody who's watching, Lord, that, that they'll understand that they're free, that you've broke those chains, that you've casted them off, that they don't need to be trapped in the whispers of a demon or the devil, that you've set them free 
and they'll always be free because of the blood that you shed. Thank you, Jesus. Amen.